Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 85. Are you getting the most out of the Django framework? It's a powerful web framework if you're not interested in reinventing the wheel. Django includes a useful template system with inheritance for composing reusable HTML. This week on the show, we have previous guest and Real Python author Christopher Trudeau to talk about his recent articles and courses about Django. Christopher explains how Django templates help you avoid rewriting large portions of HTML for your web applications. His first article covers built-in tags and filters provided by the framework. And the second one dives into how to customize and implement your own filters and tags. Christopher also talks about his process for choosing topics for articles and courses. And we talk about his Django REST framework course. But we start the episode by covering a recent article by CPython developer and residence, Wukus Langa. We had talked in a previous episode about his plan to study where all the Python core developer activity goes, and he's gathered several years of GitHub data, and Christopher and I discussed the post. This episode is brought to you by CloudSmith. CloudSmith is a secure software supply chain management tool for your Python packages and dependencies. Try CloudSmith for free at cloudsmith.com slash sign up. Let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher. Welcome back to the show. Hey there. How are you doing? Good. I wanted to start off this episode doing like a little bit of a follow-up from episode 82, where I had uh, Wukas Langa on. And he was talking about compiling all this data in his process of being the developer in residence. And he was using this library called Dataset and kind of assembling all this data from GitHub. And so he wrote an article about it uh, on his blog. And so I'll include a link to it. And the title is, Where Does All the Effort Go? looking at Python core developer activity. I thought it was kind of neat because it really wrapped up our conversation. You know, he was talking, he was going to do this, he was thinking about it. I don't know, I was really intrigued by what he found inside there, these sort of busy areas that are sort of deep inside the interpreter. There's like three or four little areas he focused on. He spent time analyzing date ranges, like kind of like you know when the work was done, which seems to stay pretty, as far as the, pull requests and the merging seems to be pretty consistent. There were some peaks here and there, I guess were definitely like sprints that were happening. And then the area that he was trying to convey in the podcast was that the areas that were getting touched were really deep inside the interpreter. It wasn't clear to me from the article because of the timelines that he was talking about there's been a fair amount of work done on because of the switch of the parser yeah in the last couple of releases so i, I it wasn't clear to me it, it, the information is beautiful i love the fact that he went through and did this i just wasn't sure uh, because i you know i didn't sit down and go through a calendar and go when did this match what version right right <laughs> break the data set yourself yeah i wasn't sure whether or not it uh, lined up with going to the new parser or not. And, and I wondered whether some of that internal touching was because of that or whether that was uh, like an, a longer standing norm. So it might be interesting to see what, because I guess most of that change happened in 3.9. So it might be interesting to see whether or not that those same internal pieces were touched as much during 3.8. Yeah, and the, the dates kind of start, like his generation point for this thing is like February of 2017, as far as the data set that he created for it. And so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening um, inside of, I guess it was called pegen.c. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's the peg parser, right? Yeah, and then yeah. there's a parser.c. And so those kind of modifications and changes there. The typing module got a lot of stuff. Yeah, and I, I remember there being something in with C eval as well. And I'm assuming that, you know, the evaluation function is probably going to have something attached to the parser, right? That just sort of makes sense to me. So, yeah. So, yeah, a lot of work going on there. And so it'd be interesting to see. Well, I mean, there's lots of interesting projects that are out there uh, right now as far as like, 
thinking about ways to speed stuff up. And so maybe these will be areas that continue to have lots of focus kind of going forward. But I, I don't know. I was intrigued by that. And then he spent some time talking about kind of the top contributors. And there's a whole bunch of bots that are used to kind of merge things in. And those were high up there. But then also like Pablo, the release manager for 310, and then himself. <laughs> so release managers had a lot of stuff. But you would, if you look through the list, there's some pretty common, you know, suspects <laughs> in the Python world you'll see inside there. Previous guest, Brett Cannon and, you know, Guido himself and a bunch of other kind of interesting people. It'd be interesting to see, um, you'd have to grab data from somewhere else or pull the people or whatever, but I'd be interesting to see how many of those are paid contributors. Right. Um, like, I know, I know it's a heavy volunteer community and it's one of the things that makes Python great. But there are folks who work for organizations who are paying their salaries so that they can contribute to Python. And I'm curious, you know, well, if you pay me 40 hours a week to to play with Python, then, uh, yeah, I might be contributing more, right? So, uh, yeah. Or, the, you know, the, the couple corporations allow, you know, like a day a week or something yeah. like that to yeah, maybe your, contribute. Your 20% time or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think of like Brett Cannon might be one of those because he, he always jokes that he, uh, you know, works to fund his open source habit right and uh so things like that but yeah i i that would be interesting to kind of get that kind of balance you know it's just kind of cool to have somebody actually finally kind of pull the stuff out and then the other thing that he wanted to focus on was like the amount of time it takes for merging a pr so this kind of idea of like a drive-by contributor or you know somebody's not you know part of the core team you know how likely or you know what's involved in reviewing it because there maybe there isn't as much conversation behind this particular pr and so he did kind of some some measurements there and could definitely be an area that could help him work on stuff but i think it's mostly the idea is just to illuminate what's happening which i think is great and then the very end of it we spent some time in the episode talking about bpos or bugs.python.org and his goal is to maybe tackle that data set next, but it's a little harder to wrangle. It sounds like it's definitely uh, organized differently than how GitHub is. So, right. Yeah. Well, it, it, he also, um, so the, the, the blog post the following week uh, after doing the data stuff was on the, uh, the no gill piece, which of course is going through the community like wildfire right now. Yep, it is. Yeah. <laughs> he did a good job of actually just sort of summarizing it because I'd seen little bits and pieces in a whole bunch of different places and, it was a nice, just sort of one place. You know, these these are these are the things to consider. These are the changes we think it'll have. Uh, these are the cultural uh, impacts of it, right? Uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, dark extensions where you, you know you, you think you tested everything, and then there's somebody out there who has written an extension that isn't publicly available, and you might be breaking it, right? So uh, trying to consider all that. So uh, he did a good write up of that as well. So I think uh, he may have found a new follower for his blog. He's he's got some good content on there. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's been kind of fun just watching his posts uh, throughout the, you know, since July. He just has a kind of nice way of summarizing things. And I definitely want to follow more on this whole No Gill <laughs> project. Maybe Sam Gross might be interested in coming on the show. We'll have to see. Yes. Cool episode. Something fun to talk about. Nice deep dive. So to pivot to you, we've been working together for, gosh, uh, at least two years now. Two years, yeah. Uh, or it will be next month. Yeah, and it's been great. And, you know, we've been working on lots of video courses together, and then you've been writing some articles. And actually, recently, a couple kind of uh, cool articles about Django coming out. And I thought maybe we could spend a little chunk of our time together talking about why you picked that, but also maybe, you know, like, what is your background with Django? And, and sure. you know, why do you end up using it in the projects that you do? Yep. For listeners who haven't seen some of my courses, I routinely joke about being an old man. Uh, that's partially because I'm an old man. <laughs> Python is my uh, eighth or ninth language, I think. And I've been doing it for a little over 10 years now. I picked it up when I was at a company that had been bought and there was absolutely nothing to do during the day. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll pick up a new programming language because there wasn't much else to do. And I used it to solve a, a small problem that had no deadline attached to it. And I kind of liked the language. And, I, and so the next startup I was at, I was hired to make 
all the big technological decisions. And so one of the decisions was, screw it. If I got to code, I'm going to code it in a language I like. <laughs> because we were doing a bunch of web-based stuff, it, I essentially went through and I did a quick pass-through of a couple different of the uh, web frameworks. Zope frightened me. Flask was still fairly young at the time. And uh, so Django was kind of where I started out. And it's now... It starts to become, I think with any framework, it becomes like a self-fulfilling thing. The more you use it, the more you get uh, to know how it works. So if you're going to do something quickly, you know, I I could go pick up another one or I can just whip this together in Django quickly. Yeah. So so it tends to be self-reinforcing because you pick something up and then you're just learning that new thing and uh, you end up with more knowledge with it. So it tends to be sort of my go-to for any sort of web type stuff. And, and deeply enough that it's actually influenced even my decisions around my JavaScript libraries. So not that you can't do React with Django, but because Django is a little more Web 1.0, something like Vue.js that's a little lighter weight and interacts a little better, uh, it fits my thinking of how the web should be a little more. So even when I'm looking at job, writing JavaScript, I'm thinking about my Django, how, you know, how, how easy is it to make these things fit together, essentially? Yeah, and that's something you tackled at the end of your DRF course, um, which we maybe we'll talk a little bit more near the end of the Django REST framework course. And then the thing I wanted to talk about a little bit that, you know, there was... I don't hear it as much. Uh, maybe I'm not listening <laughs> to to uh, people kind of out there arguing like the whole Django versus Flask thing, I think was like quite the, the topic two, three years ago. And I feel like the camps have, you know, decided and, and they're not necessarily like sitting there trying to figure it out as much anymore. But I definitely understand what you're saying. Like, you know, Flask was like this go-to thing for a lot of people and they were thinking, okay, microservices and I'm going to separate everything apart. And I definitely look at Flask when I'm going to do like something like really simple. And we were talking a little bit before we we started about this, that, you know, like if you're going to stand up like a visualization or or something where you just have like one file or something like that, a lot of them actually have it built in, um, which is kind of interesting. But once the project moves beyond that, it, it's kind of like, okay, well, actually this thing needs uh, you know, to connect to this database. And okay, and this thing needs to have users or you know, what have you. And pretty soon in something like Flask, you're rolling your own you know, kind of everything. Yeah, or, or there's libraries for all of it. But then what you're doing is cobbling together five different libraries. And what you've done is reinvented Django by the right. time you're done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, so that's what I love about Django is definitely that part of it that you can stay pretty small, like if you want. I mean, it's got maybe a slightly larger footprint generally, but you know, in as far as starting a project, the nice thing is that it has the idea of batteries included. Yeah, very much so. I, I, I honestly, it's I, I would love someone to actually peel it apart. I would love it to be three packages. And when you install Django, you just get all three. And so for most people who don't have to think about it, they can just get all three. But I would really love to be able to just use the Django ORM or just use Django's templating. There are some cases where that's all I've needed. And I've you know, just used all of Django and not touched any of the rest of those parts simply because that was what I wanted to do because it was faster than, you know, okay, I haven't touched SQL Alchemy in 10 years. I don't, I'd have to relearn it. So it's just easier for a quick one-off script to use, you know, Django's ORM instead. But it's one of those things that often seems to come up in the community where folks say, oh, well, let's do this. And then somebody goes and looks at it and goes, yeah, but that touches this and this touches that and that touches, the yeah, let's not do that. So it seems to come and go kind of cyclically as to as somebody goes, oh, I'll, I'll tackle that. And then it kind of dies. So, uh, so I, I, you know, I, if I could wave a magic wand, I'd love it to be three <laughs> libraries, but right. I, I'm not, uh, I'm not willing to uh, spend months and months trying to do a PR to do it myself. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take what I can get. All right. Well, you're putting it out into the universe now. So <laughs> oh, it's, it's been out in the universe for a while. I don't think it'll make any difference. So <laughs> Well, kind of talking about templating and your recent two articles, the first one, what came out in September, was Django Templates with built-in tags and filters. 
I think maybe initially these were going to be combined and then you decided to kind of split them apart or I was kind of wondering your process of like why you decided to tackle these and at risk of revealing the 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 man behind the curtain a little bit uh there's a giant trello board that real python uses actually two of them one for articles and one for courses yep <laughs> and you can get uh sometimes there's like a call for an article on one of the trello boards we'd like an article on this topic or as an article writer, I can say, oh, I've got an idea and I can put it on the board and it goes through a little process to see whether or not, you know, there'll be enough uh, interest to, to warrant writing the article. And I was sort of flipping through it. I think it was back in the spring and I saw a request for uh, an, an article on everything Django templating. And because I, generally when I write articles, I tend to write stuff I know fairly well, which is kind of different than the courses. I'm willing to learn something for the course. I don't know why mentally that's different, but it's a different different mental space for me. So when I go to write an article, it tends to be because, oh, okay, I, I know how to do that. I don't have to look too much up. And I saw this and I went... Yeah, that article is going to be huge given the <laughs> list that they wanted, and so I just went uh, went to the editor and said, "Hey, um, uh, let's let's split this into two different pieces." And we had a conversation about whether it should be like a true part one, part two, and we kind of decided not to, um, so that they stand on their own. But they're they're siblings, and really, what it comes down to is Django's got a very strong uh, mechanism inside of it for doing templating to make it easier to do HTML. HTML. Yeah. There's a lot of boilerplate in HTML, a lot of repetition. And for most websites, you've, you know, you've got the nav bar. It has to show up on every single page. Well, you don't want to write that over and over again. So the templating language allows you to reuse components. And it's got a whole bunch of both logical mechanisms for, you know, repeating things. So if you're putting out a list, it'll do, you know, a, a thing like a for loop for LI items inside of a UL, as well as data mechanisms, which are called filters. So if you've got a date, you can apply the filter and use the filter to change how the data is shown. So the templating language has all that stuff built in, but it also has mechanisms for writing your own versions of these. There's, I don't remember, there was, there's 50 or 60 built-in tags, and then there's a whole bunch that are available that aren't part of the primary import. So doing an article on that, you can basically almost do a book on it. So uh, then adding on the custom written tags and filters on top of it just would have made the article extremely long. And so we kind of split it down into two and uh, uh, kind of struggled through uh, the two different pieces. In, in fairness, I think it's a bit of a different audience as well. You need the templates and the filters. If you're doing you know, Web 101 Django project, you're going to want to learn the templates and filters. The, there are so many built-in ones, you can go a long time before you have to write your own. So I'm not even sure. It's probably a good thing that they're separate because, you know, you, you, can, you can put the custom stuff a fair ways down the list of I have to read this and learn this and concentrate on other things instead. So the first one really is focusing on, hey, let's get you prepared to understand what's happening with Django templates. Yes. Uh, so it covers so the it so that there's a inheritance concept inside of the templates so that you can reuse components kind of similar to the way you would in a class. Yeah. There are functional things like repetition, like for loops, uh, if if then else conditionals, all that kind of pro programming type stuff. Uh, and then there's also blocks so that you can do things like you know, comment a chunk of code out, that kind of thing. So the the template tags section sort of talks about those different concepts uh, it really is a mini programming language yeah the creators of django originally worked at a uh, newspaper and it was a couple programmers that were creating sort of a, a cms like tool because they didn't want to actually they couldn't find a cms they liked so they sort of decided they're going to build something but rather than build the cms they'd build something that helped them build that kind build that kind of thing and they were working with web designers who were not programmers. So they intentionally made the distinction between the Python is the business logic code. And we don't want, unlike, say, PHP, where you've got that same business logic embedded into the HTML, they intentionally did not want to give their designers that control. So they came up with this templating language that essentially gave their designers a lightweight version of programming, but uh, stopped them from being able to shoot themselves in the foot. 
So there's this very distinct line between sort of the backend parts and the templating parts. So the templating parts essentially are uh, often have direct uh, correlation to concepts inside of the Python programming language, but you're doing it inside of template tags instead. So if you're new to Django, then you kind of have to pick this up. You can't just write Python inside of the HTML and get away with it. Yeah. And, you know, for people who have maybe have brushed against it before, it's inside those curly braces with the percents and so forth. And like you said, they'll have section that will say block, and, you know, and then like a heading or uh, content blocks. And, and I think that's really cool. Like you, you kind of go into that idea that if you have a certain style or design for your whole site inside of this templating system, you kind of create a base template of like, okay, this is what maybe it's got the nav bar or, you know, other kinds of elements that you would use all the time. And then the rest of them don't, you don't have to rewrite that whole HTML yeah. chunk. You can say extends from, which is really cool. Yeah, and I find that, uh, you know, like that the, the stuff that I'm working on right now, most of the pages that I'm writing are maybe 50 lines. Okay. And you just can't build HTML that way, right? Like the, 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 the base page is twice that. Right. But because you're not <laughs> having to repeat all of that, you just basically, I do a fair amount of work inside of Bootstrap because I'm lazy and that's how everybody does it. And it's just sort of the go-to way now yeah. rather than design all the CSS myself. And so there ends up, there's a concept in Bootstrap called a container. And that's usually where the actual heart of your web page goes. So I've got a tag inside of that with a block that is called container and it corresponds to the bootstrap container and all the child pages are just extends base and here's the stuff that goes in the container so you're concentrating on the content on the page rather than you know the headers the footers you know your your nav bars all that kind of thing and so it, it gives you a, a, a relatively clear separation of concerns right it it also has a mechanism in it which is similar to something like a number include in C. So you can extend a template or you can suck one in. So that allows you to do reusable components as well. So for example, if you want to put the nav in its own file and just keep the nav on its own inside a page that uses the nav, you can say include nav.html. So between the two mechanisms, there, there's a fair amount of power to structure your pages and give you sort of the way of thinking about how you want your HTML composed in a logical fashion uh, instead of you know sort of the prescriptive page by page mechanism that would be how you would do it if you were doing it from scratch yeah yeah and it definitely is using that whole you know don't repeat yourself kind of yes uh, <laughs> ideas you know unfortunately it may take a couple passes on something like this to kind of figure out where to use but yeah, i wasn't familiar with a lot of these are, are really kind of cool like include uh, i hadn't been using that that sounds like a really handy one for me and then i really like how like you're saying it, it kind of can separate the concerns uh, in 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 a way that you, you can still have it lay out or walk through the data and and deal with that kind of your if else loops and you know kind of also have like a, a for loop as far as like okay show me all this information inside of there I just really enjoyed that part of it and I was I was using when I was talking about the whole idea of like okay I'm working inside of Flask and I was like doing data visualizations and then basically we wanted to turn it into a tool that was a little more interactive and then separate users could have different information inside of it. And so I was like, okay, I, I think I'm going to use Django for this. And so I kind of pivoted it all. And then it was interesting to do kind of like table layout stuff and these other kinds of things in, inside the templating there, you know, of like kind of addressing what data is being sent in and then where you want to lay it out. And it's pretty powerful. Yeah, it allows you to essentially start thinking about the HTML as the way you would structure programming code. Yeah. And, you know, you can think first start out programming until somebody teaches you why you have functions. You end up with, you know, there, there's no function and it's just one long script and it's 200 lines long. And right. then then you're, oh, wait, if I put this in a function, I can call it again, right? And, and essentially, if you don't, HTML by nature is very much that way, right? It's a document structure. And the templating language allows you to start treating it a little more 
hierarchically and componently, like uh, I'm making up words now, componently. <laughs> That's okay. I do it all uh, the time. <laughs> I'll, uh, I, I, I come up with the Latin and then it'll sound, uh, then it'll sound real. Yeah. So it, it essentially just allows you to, to restructure things in a way that uh, feels to me more reusable the way you would inside of, say, a, a linear programming, functional programming language like Python. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a great tutorial for people to kind of just go beyond like, okay, you know, we have several tutorials, like here's how to start (laughs) and and get going. And this is kind of like, okay, let's focus on how you can kind of use these kind of tools. And I really like that. Like, I think that's been kind of a, a nice area that you've been focusing on of like, let's dive into this area and kind of demystify and see if you can get more mileage out of this tool that, that you might already be using. Right. Security within software supply chains has become the major focus for developer and engineering teams. CloudSmith is a software supply chain management tool that provides public and private Python repository hosting for ultra-fast and secure delivery of your Python packages. CloudSmith is a fully compatible PyPI like repository. With CloudSmith, you have the ability to develop your Python packages internally and privately share them with other teams across your organization. To get started with your own private Python repository, visit cloudsmith.com slash sign up for more information. Then the second one you did then, so as you broke it apart, then um, this one I didn't have as much time to dive into, but you mentioned it before, but the idea of, okay, let's say you want to do custom tags and filters. How is that a little bit different? So uh, because of this separation of concerns between the Python programming language and the templating language, there are things you just can't do inside of the templating language. And every once in a while, if you're doing something that's a little more complicated, you're going to run into a situation where you're like, I wish I could just put some Python here. Just let me put some Python here and it'll solve the problem. (laughs) Yeah. And so there's sort of two things that you can do uh, because because you're not allowed to do that. You have a choice. Uh, you can either put that code inside of your view and then try to make sure that you're passing all of the data down into the template from the view. And depending on how tricky the code you're doing, that might actually get complicated because you can't always get the data in a clean way to hand it down to the f- a page. Sometimes you want the logic happening in the page. So your other alternative is to write a template tag or a filter that does this. And essentially what you're doing is creating your own tag that then is just maps to a function or a class underlying in Python. And it, it, you are in full control of what gets rendered on the page inside of this custom tag. So the example that I use in the article was a markdown renderer. And so you could embed Markdown inside of the web page and you put that between two tags. And what would happen is the Django rendering engine sees your custom tag called Markdown. It takes all the content inside of it, passes it down to your class, and then your class goes, okay, what do I do with this? And in in this situation, I called out a third-party Markdown renderer that turns Markdown into HTML and then had that returned to the rendering engine. So then Django spits out whatever you give it in place on the page, and now you're able to take Markdown and put it into HTML directly. And, you know, a classic use of this kind of thing is, you know, one of the things, because HTML itself is dangerous, uh, <laughs> yeah. if you're allowing people to submit, like, you know, comments to your forum and they want to be able to, uh, you know, put a little bit of bolding or italics or whatever, if they submit HTML, you have to scrub that because they might, in, you know, JavaScript is valid HTML and they might do things that break your page or infect someone else who's reading the page. And so you have to be very careful about allowing people to do that. So a common uh, solution to that is to use something like Markdown. So uh, you're not writing your comment in HTML, but you do, you are able to make it bold. Uh, and then in the back end, you translate that. So this particular tag, instead of allowing the back end to do it, would just allow the back end to go, hey, here's this chunk, and you could do it inside of the template engine instead. So this is kind of a, you know, th- this is a sort of typical use of these kinds of things. 
I find like when I've used it in practice, it it's very much there's sort of two different places, either something very u- reusable like that markdown situation or some very, very esoteric corner case of this is just too hard to do in a view and the template language isn't, isn't uh, strong enough for whatever the case is. Uh, and then you end up with a tag that's really, really specific to your project, but it does allow you to, uh, uh, you know, open up the hood and uh, customize as you need to be. Yeah, it's nice that that it's there, you know, to be able to kind of expand upon it. Is it kind of following in the idea of what you were talking about before of like it, it being fairly object oriented that you can kind of inherit and kind of build on top of? Yeah, so there's, there's, depending on how, depending on what you're building, there are sort of simple things and there are complex things. And the simple ones tend to map to functions. Okay. Uh, and the really, really simple ones, you can actually use a decorator that is, in fact, it's called simple tag. And essentially, this is, you declare a function, you you got to put it in the right place so that Django can find it. But if you declare a function and say, this is a simple tag, whatever, whatever you spit back is what the renderer uh, spits out for you and it will automatically name the tag and so like in a couple lines of code you can build your own thing and then that's on sort of one end of the spectrum and there's a whole bunch of steps in between but on the other (laughs) end of the spectrum you end up building a class that has full access to the parsing nodes of the things between your block so that markdown example that i gave you're getting passed in the tree of what's in between so that you can actually have things like nested django tags inside of it or you can have html inside of it or whatever you want and because you're getting access to the parser you can say oh what's inside of here and you could have nested Django tags, have the Django parser parse it, and then do something with it. So on that end, you're building out a couple classes in order to get that to work. So depending on what your needs are, what you're trying to do, uh, you, you know, there's a there's a range of choices. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I have a question that's kind of off to the side of this. It kind of goes back to the type of projects that you're doing and a tool that we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, which is cookie cutter. Yep. Is that something that you use in practice? No. Okay. No, I haven't. But I'm familiar with it, and uh, it's one of those I've always kind of wanted to look into more, but I haven't played with it. It's an interesting tool, especially if you're, I guess, maybe creating similar projects across uh, maybe different clients or things like that, where you may, you know, as far as the infrastructure build part of it, uh, you could maybe reuse like, okay, this Docker container, this, this, uh, you know, OS or whatever that's inside of it and these assets and, you know, this database or what have you. I think it's kind of an interesting area uh, to kind of build on top of. I'm looking, I'm hoping to maybe get somebody on to talk a little more about it. Cause it's something I'd, I'd like to learn a little more about. Yeah, my understanding is, so Django is very much inspired by Rails, and both Django and Rails have commands in them that are things like start a new project. Yeah. And it creates all the files that you need, the settings files and the directory structure and all the rest of it, so you don't have to build that from scratch. And my understanding is cookie cutter is essentially a generic version of that. So if you needed to do something like start project in Django with cookie cutter, you could do something equivalent for whatever your purposes are. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a pretty good summary of of the details diving into those recent articles. Maybe we could talk a little bit about one of the big ones that you tackled. Uh I'm guessing it was was at the end of last year. Um was it the was DR- January, yeah. Yeah, it was the DRF course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what's your background with the Django Rest framework? Uh, I was trying to solve a particular problem. So uh, Django is still sort of very web 1.0. It likes, you know, you use the template language to spit out some HTML. Um, And as you start doing more uh, deeper things with JavaScript and single page or single page like applications, Django doesn't get in the way, but it isn't particularly helpful. And so a common pattern is if you're using something like React or I've been using Vue.js, you've got, uh, you know, the HTML gets spit out, but then the JavaScript is responsible for doing a lot of the rendering. And as a result, what ends up happening is what you need from the back end is something that just spits out like an API view of the data rather than, say, an actual rendered template. 
And I was building a teaching tool uh, at the time, and I was playing around with Vue.js a fair amount. And so I was finding that I was writing these little custom API pieces. And so I was sort of like, okay, I know there's tools out there for this. I should, I should, you know, dig into them. Why am I reinventing the wheel? And one of the more popular ones is the Django REST framework, the DRF. And so I just essentially started playing with that. And it, it's got a, a fairly robust mechanism for mapping your data classes and your views into an API. Uh, it's got an underlying permission structure. It's got the ability, uh, like it's got a, a fairly rich routing mechanism as well. So you can you can ask for information about a particular class or you can pass data up to edit a class or you can create a new class. And it uses all the HTTP commands in order to sort of do this. So it's, it's a pretty robust library. The documentation is written for someone who is familiar with the framework. So if you hadn't seen it before, it's a bit of a slog. The first few examples are, and you know all these things. And it felt kind of backwards to me. Like it it didn't start with, oh, here's a simple case. And then you add this and then you add this. And this is a common problem that we have in our industry because the folks who are writing this documentation and 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 bless them that they wrote it because the worst case is that you don't write it at all. Yeah. So you know, I understand this is these are degrees of complaints, right? But oftentimes, when you've got technical people who have been you know into the, up to their necks in a, in a library for years and years, when they go to write the documentation, they're telling you things that, as a new learner, aren't are, are it's just overwhelming. Right. It's it's something that they want to know. Like yes, yeah. It, like this is a thing that I would look for. But yeah, yeah. And, and once you know it, this makes the documentation easier to use because you can find the thing that you want very right. easily. But <laughs> uh, you know, there's a, there's a sort of a difference between a documentation and a tutorial. Yeah. And I, I was struggling a little bit as I was going through this, and so I had uh, kind of gone through that process. I thought, oh well, this will make a good course. Let me let me turn this on its head and try to sort of build it from you know the ground up. You know, do this. This is the simple thing, and then let's add this, and then let's add this, and let's add this. And uh, you know, you were kind enough to say that there might be some interest in that in the field. And so, uh, next thing I knew, I had I think it was some ridiculous amount of it's hours, isn't it? It's a couple hours long. It's one of my longer courses. Yeah, two hours and ten minutes, thirteen lessons. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's pretty pretty intense, <laughs> it, well, but good. It, it's, it's it, yeah, it's intense, but it's also like the the well, the library's very deep is really what it comes down to, and so there's there's concepts in there. There's some surface level concepts that you can get things going fairly quickly, but when you start to, a lot of it depends on what you're trying to build, right? So that there's an idea inside of it. Like the first part is serialization, so you have to figure out how to take something that's in your models or your database, and how do you spit that into what's typically JSON, right? So that it can be consumed by your web client. So you've got to understand that kind of concept of a serializer, and then there's a concept of a view that they call a view set that it maps some URL to I need to get at this, right? So if I've got a database with people in it, I have a serializer for the people. And that says, oh, let's take first name and turn that into a string in JSON and put that in the first name field. And then I'm going to have a a view that says, uh, you know, I type in the URL slash people and it'll list all the people and, and or I can have slash person slash three and that'll give me the third person, the person with ID three. So there's a mechanism to map those URLs to the actual data. And then oftentimes in these situations, you do not want this information to be public. Right. I don't want every single person in my database to be exposed unless you are someone who is supposed to be able to see this. Right. Like if somebody was sitting there with like an open URL like that and they could see structurally where things are, they could just like type in... Like, oh, let's see what number 12 is, you know, or, or That's whatever. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, well, and this is, you know, whether the DRF or anything else, right? That, that w- Unfortunately, the nature of the web is we are always double authenticating everything. So we, we check it on the front end to be user-friendly, but then we have to check it on the back end because somebody might have just tampered with the URL to see what's there. Hey, I'm person number five. I wonder who person number six is. Well, if you're not supposed to see person number six, that might be problematic. So yeah, so there's a, there's a permission mechanism 
built into this as well, and it's tied into Django's authentication pieces. So you can start building out permission libraries, and it's fairly robust, uh, and it allows you to do things like, oh, well, Mr. Bailey's allowed to see even-numbered users, and you could write a class that did that, and, and, and if you put in, you know, for user number three, it would say, nope, sorry, 403, you're not allowed to see odd number users. Right. So it's got that sort of permission mechanism for doing that. It, it's also got a very, so it's kind of like the Django admin, which is a tool for uh, manipulating the ORM. It's got a viewer that's built in. So if you, and you can turn it on or off depending on whether or not you want to expose the interface, but you can hit the URL rather than hitting it as JSON, you can hit it with a, uh, with a web browser and it gives you an interface to, to query things and make changes. Yeah. So when you're debugging your API, you can turn this on and go in and manipulate it without actually having to build all this stuff yourself. So all these pieces kind of fit together and you can get into things like, nested pieces as well so you know i gave the example of people well if we've got people in the system and what cars they drive i can have a nested url that says give me the people and their cars and it will join those two things in the database and spit out you know some json that says you know person christopher bailey cars square bracket you know whatever uh, a 73 volvo uh, i'm sure right <laughs> that's it yeah that's so well in a colorado winters <laughs> yes exactly so uh, so you've got uh, and this is why you've got 2 hours of content there in the course is that there's a lot of you know a, a lot of deep pieces to it and it's uh, it's a good library. It's very well written. The documentation's decent. Uh, once you're once you've got your head around what the the terminology is, yeah. The only one that again, you know, if I if I had a magic wand, uh, it, the permissions module is too friendly. Hmm. Per, too permissive, <laughs> or no? Uh, yeah. It, it, the The defaults are to allow things that if I if I were to redesign it from scratch, I would not do that way. I, I would rather it be harder to accidentally expose something. So it, it tends to be that area where I'm very very cautious about and, and test and test and test because I I've, I've shot myself in the foot a couple times mucking around with that. Every time I think I understand it, I have to go back to my own documentation. And go, how did I do that? <laughs> yeah. You know, you're talking about the idea of like, if you're going to teach a subject like this, and I've definitely, my approach, and I've mentioned multiple times on the podcast, that like to get into working for real Python was like, I really want to learn this thing and I want to teach it. And then so taking, say, a set article, how do I make a visual? What kind of examples can I add to it? You know, how can I kind of expand it? And definitely one of these things with, you know, REST frameworks that that word of serialization like was like like a weird like kind of black box for me for a little while like right. what do they mean like am i am i literally sending this down a serial port so everything has to be single file and, and <laughs> you know showing your age yeah, what's a serial port exactly dude? <laughs> <laughs> i know <laughs> versus a parallel printer port you know or whatever <laughs> this week i want to shine a spotlight on another real python video course it's an advanced web development course for those who want to take working with Django further, and it's titled Building with Django REST Framework. This course was created and presented by Christopher Trudeau. In the course, you'll learn about the REST protocol, Django REST Framework serializers, and how to use them with Django objects, using Django views and DRF view set classes to create REST endpoints, multiple flavors of renderers and how to control their output, specifying permissions and limiting who can see what data in your REST API. This is an advanced course, but if you're interested in learning the topic, several prerequisite RealPython courses and articles are shared at the beginning. The course includes code samples to check your work along the way. And like most of the video courses on RealPython, the course is broken into easily consumable sections with a transcript and closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. So that there was like things have to be organized to be able to basically be fed into the system, and so I, I enjoy that part of it. It's definitely one of those things that I, I think that you and I and a lot of the other video course instructors that you know we really want to try to like break some of these terms down and kind of get them familiar. And so what it made me think about is as you start to 
do other courses and you've always like should be like congratulating you it's not out yet but you just completed your 20th course <laughs> yes and so yes. congratulations thank you the, the whiskey is on the way um <laughs> excellent <laughs> i wonder about like what goes into you picking a course because you know you've focused a lot on django you've had a hand, handful of those kinds of courses and then you had some interesting ones about uh, other deeper topics like uh, i think of the uh, regular expressions one as yet another really kind of like deep topic where you spend a, a, a chunk of time focusing on okay well what is this thing and then, okay, well, then how do you do it in Python? <laughs> and right. I, which I, I think is kind of interesting. So I guess there's a couple of questions there. Like, you know, how do you pick these courses? And then how how do you feel like you're adding or changing things up in, in from the article to to what you're presenting in the course? Right. With the exception of courses like the DRF, where I'm doing it from scratch, uh, most of the most of the courses are based on an existing article. So uh, the course writers have a advantage that the article writers don't. I can look at the comments on a course on an, excuse me, I can look at the comments on an article and go, oh, uh, that caused confusion. Yeah. Uh, and so that allows me to, you know, get a little bit of feedback. Uh, it's also, you know, the medium's different, right? Yeah, definitely. It's easier to, and you know, for folks who've taken some of my courses before, you you know, I've got sections called tangent, and I've got sections <laughs> called skippable, yeah. and so there's sometimes there's things that I'm just like, I find this interesting, and it's kind of connected, and maybe you will too, and if you do, great, stick with me, and if you don't, you're not going to miss anything, move on to the next thing, and so that there's uh, so that there's a little bit of that kind of going on that allows you to sort of uh, play with things a bit more. It, it's very difficult i find unless you're um you know, like unless you're writing something that is a full from first steps to maturity uh, it's often hard to know what your what your audience knows and what do they don't know yeah and so it's i find sometimes sometimes you're sort of like okay so you know take a case like um you know the data structures courses the data structures courses were covering things that are part of a pretty typical cs education so if you've gone through say a college or university cs course most of it would be how do i do this in python so i don't expect someone picking that article up to be somebody who's necessarily got that background. So when I was writing that course, I was very much trying to focus on, okay, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm teenage me again, and I've got some programming books, and the modern equivalent is the entire internet. <laughs> right. How do I figure this stuff out? So I, you know, I tried to sort of aim that course at somebody who didn't necessarily have that, you know, university background. So you're trying to make a guess when you do that as to, you know, who would be interested in this. And, you know, the DRF course by an, a, a counterexample, uh, you're not going to even be thinking about that unless you've got a fair amount of familiarity with Django. So I'm not going to spend any time in that and saying, this is what a view is. Cause if you don't know what a view is, go, you know, you should probably be trying another course first. Right. So there's always sort of a bit of a balancing yeah. act. There's some prerequisite needed there. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, and it's, it's hard to know, um, uh, because everybody's got their own backgrounds and, you know, and some of the topics, uh, you know, that there's more sort of, theoretical stuff in it and some of the topics there's this is very python specific right and so it kind of changes things but to get to your question about the selection i'm all over the shop so sometimes something like the drf it was hey i feel like there's a gap here i think this is you know i i wish this had existed and somebody's going to pay me to create it fantastic and uh there are other things that are you know i look at something and uh, you know the regex one is something that I always felt weak on. I know they're there. I know what they're used for. I'm not intimately familiar with them. They're one of those skills that, uh, you know, I always sort of look up. I'm like, okay, this is a situation where I'm going to use a regex. Now I got to dig out the document and how do I do that again? Right. And so when that article came up, I was like, oh, this, this is a good chance for me to learn this stuff again and to sort of re solidify it a little bit. There's, I think it was the physicist Feniman who said, you know, that you know one of the best ways to know whether or not you understand something is try try explaining it to somebody. So there, there is an aspect of that with some some of my selection. Uh, the Pi game course for sure was definitely that. I, I hadn't used the library before. Uh, it looked like fun. 
I've got, uh, I've mentioned it in a couple of courses, you know, I've got a, a, a younger nephew who's just getting into this and as often is the, the lead into programming is video games. So this kind of felt like, hey, that would be something fun that, uh, you know, Benjamin would like. Let's, let's teach Benjamin how to do pie game. And if somebody else can uh, uh, get something out of that, that's fantastic. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I've mentioned that my, my methodology has been outside of like a couple of the initial ones that I, I, I did. I would look at something in the language and say that is either scary <laughs> right. or fuzzy or, or, or what have you, or, you know, literally I want to learn more about it and, and, uh, you know, dive in. So for me, it was like, I would see decorators inside of like flask or, or Django or some other kind of tools that I was kind of dabbling in. And, you know, the, the people that, like you said, are, are doing the documentation for this library or aren't going to sit down and say, oh, wait, 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 you don't know what a decorator is. Let's go through what that yeah. is. Is They're just going to yeah. use them. And you're like, what are those? <laughs> yeah. And, and even, you know, like I've been coding since I was about 10 years old. So I've got f- almost 40 years under my belt and there's still huge swaths I just don't know. And, uh, you know, the, the decorators are a great example. Uh, the first time uh, I'd come across them in Java, and I kind of understood them. They were called something else in Java, but same idea. Yeah. And I'd never really had a desire to use one. And then I was starting to see them inside of Django programming because they get used to help. You know, the most common purpose is to uh, modify permissions yeah. on a view. Mm-hmm. So this view, it, you can't see this unless you're logged in, or you must be an administrator to use this view. And the decorators are great; that they're a perfect use of that. Um, and I, I've always sort of coded decorators from a perspective of, I don't. This is a little bit black magic, but it's black magic that if I copy and paste this code, I know I can say the spell correctly. I'll get the Latin right, and it'll work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And then I don't remember what course it was for, but one of them got digging into inner functions yeah. and closures and somehow during that and just trying to understand that and, and write up some slides on that, the penny dropped about, oh, right, decorators are actually functional closures. Okay, now I understand this. And I don't know why that hadn't happened before, but, you know, that, that's kind of the the fun part of, you know, writing the courses is, uh, uh, you know, I, I get some stuff out of that as well. It isn't just, uh, you know, me sitting on a hill and pontificating, <laughs> although I'm, I'm happy happy to do that as well so right <laughs> yeah for me the other one that, w- that was like that was like I-, I started perusing other libraries and seeing types all over the place and this stuff wasn't used and i was like what wait why what <laughs> what's going on here with all this extra verbiage yep. in inside yep. of these functions compared to like all these sort of tutorial things that were before it you know it was like all right now you go out into the wilderness and you see all these new things and you're like okay i need to level up um <laughs> yeah i i have a i have a rather heretical view on that i'm i'm not a fan of the type systems so I, I... all right well we won't we won't dive too deep into that <laughs> that's fine i will honestly i think it's a i think it's a useful thing in the language and if people like it great fantastic i just find it makes the functions harder to read and i'm comfortable enough in if i want a static type language i'll go use a static type language so if it allows some people an extra level of safety in python good for them but it's not something i tend to do yeah and my main goal with it wasn't necessarily for me to add it across all of the types of things that i'm using because generally i'm not doing as much interoperability and i'd like to do more open source sort of stuff but um, when I would see other projects and I would see other kinds of things to just kind of have a level of understanding that like, yeah. what is this thing and, and how is it being used? Yeah. And then that was, it was enough that I could like, okay, I can put this on the shelf and I, I can say, you know, that makes sense to me and I, I can come back to it if I need to. But I want to make sure that, that it's not just like doing something that is again, mystical that I don't, <laughs> yeah. don't well, get. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's like the regex example, right? I, I know how, I know where this is used. I know where I might want to use it. And now I know I can, I can look it up. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can open that. Uh, go, go, go Google the right thing when I need to use it kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I have these weekly questions. What, uh, what's something you're excited about in the world of Python? 
Uh, so, I, you know how we were talking about yesterday. Um, I think all three of them are going to fit together. So why don't you okay. rapid fire them all at the same time, and I'll I'll give you the one answer. Okay, cool. All right. So the second one is, uh, what do you want to learn next? But it doesn't have to be top Python, but it can be. And then the other one was just kind of like a shout out that you can say, hey, you know, point some attention towards something. Yep. So uh, my answer to all three is the same. Uh, lately, I've been doing a little bit of contribution to the Askematics library. There's a uh, tool that we use in the courses for displaying, uh, or I use in the courses. I think there's a couple other instructors that use it as well for displaying uh, code on the screen. And it's a it's a TUI, and it uses Erwid at the moment. And Erwid isn't really very well supported, so I've been slowly looking for another library to replace Erwid with. And and I think Askematics is going to be the winner. Uh, so I've been sort of trying to contribute some code to the open source library in order to make sure that I understand it before I go in and a deep dive on it. So that's kind of my learning thing. That's kind of my shout out thing. Yeah. And uh, and I'm hoping that it uh, uh, turns into a uh, slightly more uh, supportable version of my Purdy tool. So. One of the things that uh, it does quite well that I like is it's got a little virtual screen mechanism inside of it, which makes testing excellent. Uh, so one of the gaps that I have in Erwood is it's very, very hard to write good unit tests because you're issuing commands down to the terminal and those commands can't really be uh, serialized very well. And so this has got a little virtual screen thing so you can go, oh, this screen is supposed to look like this. And then you can write tests against it. So one of the things that I'm kind of looking forward to and one of the reasons I picked Askematics was uh, it, it'll allow me to get my uh, testing threshold on that tool up over the horrible 60% that it's been at for the last couple of years. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I'll definitely include uh, links to all that stuff. Where did you run into it? It was just something that you were dabbling with Erwood initially and then ah uh, I, no I, I did like a I did a I did a search uh, for uh, just different things out there after uh, I'd run into a bug in Erwood and I posted on the forums about it and got like zero response and so I started digging in a little bit and I'm like okay it doesn't look like anybody's actively supporting it and it doesn't really need to be actively supported it's it's there it works there's not much other features to be added um, but I found that there were things that I kind of needed that it didn't do. And so I just started doing some research. Uh, so yeah, I, I essentially just looked around and found two or three of the more popular ones. And Askematics was the one that had the most interactivity to it. Uh, and the need that I have uh, is to be able to control the screens well. And so that, that interactivity was kind of what sold me on, I'm going to do a deeper dive into this one. And then... Um, I had a couple questions, and so I, I posted off into uh, the uh, forum, and uh, the main maintainer, the guy who created the library, his name is uh, Peter Britton, uh, was extremely responsive and, uh, and very, very supportive of some of my ideas. And uh, I'm like, okay, good. That's if you're gonna if you're gonna start contributing, that's a good place to do it. So, uh, so I've been playing around with Askematics in my spare time for the last little while, and uh, the end intent uh, is to to make the uh, screencasting tool uh, hopefully better if or at least easier to maintain yeah yeah definitely I what I would like to do just to kind of wrap things up it kind of this is a bit of a full circle thing uh, we were talking about you know Wukush long at the beginning of it and how the model for the developer in residence is a little bit on the Django model uh, that the Django Software Foundation has of having you know, a, basically a person in residence to kind of keep things going. And while we were discussing things yesterday, we talked a little bit about how Django 4.0 is kind of on the horizon. And then I, I stumbled across their their uh, the Django Software Foundation's uh, support page, and they're trying to hit this goal for 2021 of uh, two hundred thousand dollars, and they're so close; they're at like ninety seven percent. So I'll include a link for it. But if you use a tool like this, you should. <laughs> definitely pitch some money their way, uh, it, you know, to continue the, the development. And I did read into a little bit about what's happening with uh, 4.0. You're right that they are going to uh, basically keep support uh, for uh, Python 3.6 and 3.7 in the 3.0 world yep. with long-term releases. And then 4.0 is going to focus on, you know, everything kind of going forward from there. So Python 
three eight, three nine, and three ten, and forward. And there's some really interesting stuff. They're 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 going to use a lot of the new features that are there, and the release notes are, are pretty detailed, kind of going into it. You know, going back to our conversation about uh, Python three nine last year, uh, the zone info is something that's going to be like a default uh, time zone implementation. Yeah, um, which is good. And then they're doing a few things with forms that look really it kind of like that will be really good. Yeah, they've dropped the support for the PYTZ and they're going with this uh, the the time zone, which is good. That just makes everything a, a lot more standard. Um, the other one that uh, kind of intrigued me, but I haven't played with yet, is the there's a mechanism inside of the ORM for putting constraints on certain kinds of things. So let's say you've got uh, you've got a user class that has a field for first name and a field for last name, and for whatever reason, you're not allowed to have anybody with the same first name and last name. It's a very artificial example, but let's right. go with it. Okay. So in the database, because those are in different columns, it's you have to put rules in place to try and stop that. And you can Django's got a mechanism inside of it that is called a constraint. And so you could put inside of the constraint that these two things can't be equal. And they've added uh, new sort of function mechanisms. And I think, if I understood it correctly, it may make it easier to write your own constraints. Okay. So that kind of seemed uh, like it was kind of interesting. Uh, honestly, 4.0, it looks to me like it's a cleanup release like most of the major features maybe it's just because they don't apply to me and that's you know that's the nature of things you're like oh i won't use that okay right but uh it seems to me like a big part of it is to to be the first step in those next parts and dropping support for three six and three seven yeah will make uh will allow them to uh, you know i i run into it once in a while and like i was i was saying with the ascii thing right he, he supports back to before three six and so i was writing some code and i stuck in an f string and it all like, fell Oops. over <laughs> Yeah. Right. So, so you know, that there's value from a library maintainers to to draw that line once in a while. Yeah, and you know, it kind of lets them focus their development efforts, and they have a pretty good model of of long term support. And this is still just beta. I mean, it's I don't know exactly when it'll be out. Maybe the end of this year, but yeah, they don't tend to beta for too long. I suspect it'll be this year. Okay. If not, it'll be early next. Yeah. Cool. So. If you're using Django and you're not supporting it, consider adding to it and help them hit their goal for the year. That would be great. Yeah, I, I didn't realize they were doing that right now. So uh, thank you for pointing that out. I'm going to go spend some money on them. That sounds like a good thing. Okay. Hey, Christopher, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been uh, fantastic to hang out and talk uh, Django and courses. Excellent. It's been fun. Remember, security within your software supply chain is crucial for your organization. Visit cloudsmith.com slash sign up to build your private Python repository today. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.